Um, it's really a very special day for me. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted uh, to welcome a few very special people who are here. Um, we are uh, joined today by one of our regents, uh, Regent Shauna Diggs, who's just joined us. She had to drive all the way across some terrible traffic to get here, and so um, I'd like to welcome her. And I also want to welcome several of uh, my fellow executive officers who are here with us. I understand that we have uh, Sally Churchill here with us, Dan Little, uh, Tim Lynch, and Ruth Person, as well as Royster Harper. And I hope I haven't missed any of the executive officers. If any of the others have come in while I've been talking, would you please, and I can't see very well, um, would you please just say that you're here? Okay, well, let's give the regents and uh, the executive officers a round of applause. Today's presentation is also being live streamed, and so I think we may have others joining us across some of our campuses. And so welcome to those of you that we can't see here today as well. So I've titled today's presentation, Strength, Strategy, and Success because these are really three things that create and sustain a top institution. You know, we've always had a foundation of strength, but we've added effective strategies to get even stronger. And that's what's making us more successful, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So first, let's talk about what we've seen happening in healthcare and academic medicine over the last several years because there has been a lot of change and transition. And this is really what is shaping how we do our work. Probably the single most momentous change has been national health care reform, which has hastened significant shifts in our industry, including implementation of state health exchanges, a shift from individual patient to population management, a shift from fee for service to pay for performance, reimbursement, consolidation of hospitals and physician groups, which has really resulted in much more aggressive competition for patients, and an environment of heightened compliance and regulatory reporting requirements. Additionally, reform has ushered in a new focus on access, quality, and safety as well as an emphasis on health information technology, which we have seen most directly with meaningful use, ICD-10, and electronic medical records. Notably, and due in large part to the widespread availability of online healthcare management tools, patients are much more engaged now in their care. And we're seeing changes in the healthcare workforce too, with reduced resident hours, and an imminent physician shortage, primarily in primary care, with concomitant responsibility going to mid-level providers. As an academic medical center, we face unique challenges, including the risk of being priced out of the market, especially as third-party payers offer narrow network products, causing us to have to do much more with much less. There are more medical schools cropping up, which means more competition for top students. And at the same time, students continue to face significant challenges when it comes to paying for the cost of a medical education. Federal research funding has taken some big hits with sequestration and NIH cuts, and we continue to face threats to graduate medical education with fewer state and federal dollars available for research and education, we are increasingly looking to industry and philanthropy to fill this gap. And all the while, we must find ways to stay competitive in a global knowledge economy. We know that change is always going to be a part of our world, but change creates opportunity. In the words of the Greek professor Heraclitus, nothing endures but change. It's amazing to think that a sentiment said 500 years BC rings so true today in 2014. Fortunately, 
the University of Michigan Health System remains prepared and capable because of our enviable strengths. And our most important strength is you, the 26,000 faculty, staff, students, trainees, and volunteers that make up the University of Michigan Health System. Over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to engage with many organizations and with many people. And because of those experiences, I've come to believe that the success of any organization rests in the hands of the people who do the work. You can have important goals and you can have well-developed strategies, but if you don't have the talent to execute on those strategies and to achieve those goals, it just simply doesn't matter. But here at the University of Michigan, we attract individuals who are leaders and best in their respective disciplines. And during my time as EVPMA, I have been overwhelmingly impressed with your talent, your vision, your compassion, and your dedication. I've seen firsthand your resilience in the face of challenges. I've seen your drive to do the right thing to serve others. I've seen your passion for improving and saving lives, for discovering new diagnoses and new treatments, and for defining the future of medical education. You drive our tripartite mission, and your potential to impact and influence the world is simply limitless. And what I admire so much about this place is that we are never satisfied, and we are never content. In fact, a desire to constantly improve is built into our DNA via the Michigan Quality System by applying lean thinking principles to improve quality, safety, efficiency, and appropriateness, and by always looking for ways to be and to do better, we are demonstrating how an organization gets from good to great and from great to exceptional. To successfully achieve our vision to create the future of healthcare through discovery, we needed a roadmap for strategic action. And that is why we created a strategic plan to position us to respond decisively, assertively, and nimbly to the changing environment I described at the beginning of this presentation. And this is one of the most important things that we have done during the five years that I have been here. And it's work that leverages the important opportunities in the changing environment and our many strengths. So let's talk about our strengths in education. We attract remarkable applicants. Our medical school remains in the top tier of academic medical centers. And when you are known as one of the top academic medical centers and the top academic institutions, you attract the best and brightest students. And we are fortunate to get the pick of the litter. Our students are academically gifted as demonstrated by MCAT and GPA scores, and they also have immense leadership potential. In fact, 40% of students in the incoming class of 2013 engaged in substantial leadership activities prior to applying to medical school. And to ensure that we have a diverse and well-rounded student body, we seek applicants with ethical decision-making ability, who possess excellent communication skills, and who work successfully, independently, and in teams. And while students are here, we offer a robust education that goes beyond traditional training. Our students have access to exceptional faculty and nearly 100 graduate and postdoctoral programs. At the same time, aspiring physicians are exposed to the second largest residency program in the nation. And when our students leave our medical school, they are even more remarkable than they were when they entered. 
Our students are in the top three when it comes to desirability by residency program directors nationwide. And the class that just graduated two weeks ago included 27 individuals who earned a second degree while also earning their medical degrees. We are a national leader in creating the future of medical education, too. Only 11 out of the 133 medical schools in the country were chosen by the American Medical Association to receive a $1 million grant to develop innovative and bold ideas that transform the way we train physicians. And we are one of those 11. I can share a lot of statistics and words of praise about our medical school, but I think it might be better to hear directly from some of our outstanding students. So listen to them. The people who belong here are the people who say, you know, I really want to help people. I really want to contribute. We're doing all that we can to try and live up to that vision of you know, creating a better future in medicine. I, I actually never envisioned myself coming back to the Midwest. And then once, once I got an interview and checked it out, uh, there was no other place that I visited that had the same kind of uh, community that Michigan had. You've got wonderful opportunities. You've got a family, people who are supporting you. The people are, are different because they're top-notch, you know, academically. That they're people that you want to share your notes with. You know, you want to see these people succeed, and they want to see you succeed. I, th I think that's pretty different. This project arose at Michigan because of the environment that we're in. This is something totally extra that people were doing, uh, you know, with their research time they have over the summer. So Fred and Clay, who are two fourth year medical students, and you know, he had an interest in, in health disparities. So he said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could listen to lung sounds remotely? And so I jumped on and kind of pushed their concept forward, but all with the same kind of idea of being, how can we give people who have asthma better tools to understand how they're doing. So the main thing that we're looking at is kind of redefining how do we do healthcare delivery. The purpose of the best is to take something that used to only be able to be done within a practitioner's office and be able to do it remotely. So I can listen to any spot that I could ever want to listen to on your body from halfway across the world. So we wanted to make our new prototype, more remote, more simple, but at the same time, more useful. So we decided to go from eight or 10 microphones down to one, and we could really make sure that it was wireless, it was wearable, and that that'll allow people better control over their disease, and that ultimately reduce costs. Then it becomes something that's a lot more feasible for a physician to integrate into practice. The, all these people believe in us, you know? They, they all are invested in us and want us to succeed and so the support, um, whether it's financial, whether it's mentorship, or whether it's uh, research, I just feel like there's so many opportunities uh, for people to succeed and really distinguish themselves here. Yeah, when, when you think about, like, oh, what, what if I had gone to that other school? Did I make the right decision or not? Definitely made the right one. No doors are closed to you here. And that's what we're here to do is push the envelope and just be awesome doctors. That's what it's about. I know that these awesome doctors-to-be are here with us today. Evan, Matt, and Andy, could you please stand? Oh, and another gout. Yeah. Okay, and Huad, please stand. I think they're just so wonderful. So now, let's talk about the strength and success that we have in our research enterprise. And we remain in the top tier of academic medical centers for outstanding research productivity. We have an enviable $465 million research portfolio. We rank 11th nationally in NIH funding. And our prolific researchers produce an astonishing 14 publications each and every day. And we consistently see a notable return on our research investment. Well, one way to look at this return on investment is to look at our technology transfer metrics, 
we've yielded more than $60 million in royalties in the last five years. And in 2013, we achieved our highest ever output in US patents and invention reports. Now, as I noted in the prior slide, we have an impressive research portfolio. But the majority of that, nearly 80%, comes from federal funding. And federal funding now is at risk. In the last couple of years, federal funding has declined. I mentioned that we are ranked 11th in NIH funding. And while that's good, we're trending downward, as you can see on this graph. And that is our area of greatest risk. But we've been fortunate to get some funding from other sources, like industry. And as you can see from this graph, even though this trend is slightly up, it isn't even close to making up the difference in the decline in federal funding. So we need additional ways to mitigate the decline that we're seeing in the federal funding. And one way to do this is to invest in ourselves. And we are developing strategies to do just that. And one of these strategies is our project that's called Fast Forward for Medical Innovation. Fast Forward Medical Innovation was established to identify and invest in medical school research programs with the most potential to impact science and improve health outcomes. During a retreat in 2012, researchers from across our organization identified these 10 areas of high scientific potential. And then our research board of directors narrowed these 10 areas down to these six areas. And then finally, an advisory board of national and international peers vetted the list of six down to two areas, protein folding diseases and the host microbiome. By investing our money in these two areas of science, we believe that we will accelerate the understanding, prevention, and treatment of devastating diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and ALS, as well as infectious diseases, obesity and diabetes, asthma, atherosclerosis, and colon cancer. Another funding initiative that came out of Fast Forward Medical Innovation is the MTRAC Translational Research Fund. MTRAC is a collaboration between the medical school and the university's Office of Tech Transfer and the Office of the Vice President for Research. It was funded with a $2.4 million award from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and $5.1 million of our own internal University of Michigan Health System resources. And the goal of this program is to identify, nurture, and fast forward projects with high potential for commercial success. Of 17 proposals submitted in the first round, 11 received funding. So I want to tell you about two of them. Consider this. Each one of us has three billion letters in our genetic code. And embedded within this code is biological information that can tell us about an individual's propensity for various diseases. For example, the code tells us an individual's risk for cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer's or schizophrenia. And also embedded in this code are insights about treatments that might be most effective for an individual for one of those disorders. This is what we think about when we talk about personalized diagnosis or personalized treatment. This is what we mean when we talk about personalized medicine. But currently, the process to analyze these data can be very cumbersome or very complicated. And so dissatisfied with available commercial products for sequence analysis, Drs. Kojo Elinetoba Johnson and Dr. Megan Lim and resident Mark Keel developed their own computer algorithm and suite of software tools to simplify analysis and provide a comprehensive picture of the genome that is immediately interpretable and usable by non-experts. And now, thanks in part to MTRAC funding, they are on the home stretch of commercializing their technology. And I believe that this dynamic trio is here with us today. So can we turn the lights on and ask them to stand? Well, on the other end of the spectrum of the technology is a very clever invention 
developed by Drs. Kevin Ward and Albert Shee. And this device is called an airway cradle. And it's a simple face mask that you put on a patient who is under twilight sedation to keep the patient's airway open. Traditionally, a nurse is responsible for holding the patient's jaw open to keep the airway clear. Now this invention, however, frees that nurse up to assist in other ways and improves patient safety by removing human error. This project will undergo clinical trials in the next 30 to 60 days. Unfortunately, Drs. Ward and she couldn't be with us today, but I do want to recognize their work, and I also want to recognize everyone who's been involved in this very exciting Amtrak initiative. So let's give everyone who's been involved with this a wonderful round of applause. You know, discovery drives everything that we do here. And there is impressive and important discovery that is happening across our entire health system and the rest of the University of Michigan. Hungarian physiologist and Nobel Prize winner, Aubert Chanchurji, once said, discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. Here at the University of Michigan Health System, we take it one step further. We translate discovery into devices, diagnostics, therapeutics, and technology that create the future of healthcare and deeply impact people's lives, the lives of patients like Mike Moran and his family. You know, there's a language that goes into touch, I think. It uh, doesn't have to be communicated. It's just a feeling that you get. And uh, it's not the same, you know. I was a uh, paint rep, and uh, we were spraying a farmhouse out in the country. And uh, it was a real hot, humid day. We knew that there was a power line nearby because we want to do a safety check, you know, to set our ladders, right? So as soon as I picked the ladder up off the ground, the energy arced all the way to the power line from the humidity in the air. And in that case, the power went through my arm, out my back, out my head, and I couldn't let go of the ladder until basically it blew my fingers apart. But when people have real severe injuries like Mike Moran had, he ends up at a place like this. When you see somebody damaged like this, the first thing we're doing is trying to save their life. Once we save their life, then we're trying to save their limbs. His injury was so severe, in fact, that he lost his one arm as a consequence of that. It was weird to wake up with no idea of how much trauma had happened. I didn't realize what a huge, multifaceted blow it would be. So you find different ways to get the same goal done to not let the disability define you. The solutions in the past um, have really all centered around developing better robotic limbs. The problem is if they're not controlled well and if they don't move like a normal arm, it really is just a piece of equipment. And every time I see a person with limb loss that can't control a prosthesis very well to do the simplest of tasks, it drives me insane. And that kind of thing, is why I want to continue to make advances here to help them. There are tons of challenges that people with limb loss face, and the nerves that used to go to the hand, those nerves are trying to grow back. And I was just in the shower one morning, and it, it came to me that, well, what does a nerve really want? It wants to connect up to a muscle. That's what it did before, and if it did that, so we can take a small piece of muscle and connect it up to the nerve. So you pick up the signals coming from the brain to the hand, then you can feed those to the prosthesis and the prosthesis moves. And by the same token then, we connect up the sensory nerve to give the person sensation. My goal is not to give somebody the ability to just open and close their hand. My goal is to give someone the ability to play the piano, to do something as simple as type on their keyboard at their computer. But you take his thoughts, my thoughts, and you put it all together, like I'm gonna go conquer that mountain.
Well, those responsible for this discovery and forever changing Mr. Moran's life are also here with us today. I'd like to ask Drs. Paul Siderna, uh, Melanie Urbanchek, uh, Nick Langhall, Cindy Chestek, and Brent Gillespie to please stand. Thank you. So let's talk now about the lives that we impact. Collectively, you impact millions of lives each and every year. In fact, in fiscal year 2013 alone, you handled more than 45,000 discharges, 16,000 observation cases, 1.9 million clinic visits, 50,000 surgical operations, 98,000 emergency department visits, and 4,100 births. Just think about that. The sheer volume of patients, families, and situations we handle annually at UMHS is astonishing. These numbers reflect the expertise we offer, the care we provide, and all of the work that you do to support our tripartite mission. And all the while, you remain committed to our continuous efforts to create the ideal patient care experience. And as you can see on this slide, we currently have our highest ever patient satisfaction scores, and we are already surpassing our current fiscal year goal. This is really just tremendous. Recently, I received a letter from Denise Winyarski, a University of Michigan employee whose mother spent her final days in our care. And I want to share this story with you because it makes a very special point about the importance of the team when it comes to creating the ideal patient and family-centered experience. So listen to this story. To all those who cared for my mom, Dorothy Lawrence. Some of you may know me as the daughter of a brave woman who lost her battle with esophageal cancer. Some of you may not know me at all. Whatever the case, I owe you all a deep, deep debt of gratitude for making my mom's journey one that was exceptional and extraordinary, even when we all saw where things were headed. It began with Dr. Bob Fontana delivering the devastating news to my mom in the most artful and compassionate way and ended with Dr. Tom Cunningham keeping his promise that my mom would not feel pain when she passed on. In between, many helped care for her, and my mom spoke of you as if you were family, but she wasn't the only one who felt that way. I felt it each time I was there, and thanks to you, my mom was able to enjoy life far longer than we had expected. To the nursing and other staff in the critical care medicine unit, thank you for allowing me to ask the tough questions and answering them in a way that made things simple. It helped tremendously, and though we all knew the end was near, you never treated my mom differently. To the medical residents, each of you spoke with my family as if we were your own and worked with my dad when he had a tough time making the final decision about removing life support. You didn't push, but you asked the right questions, and it made all the difference. And finally, to the leaders of the health system, you should also be proud. I got to experience firsthand what makes Michigan the leaders and best and for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. While I wish I could do more, please know that we have asked our friends and family to make a donation to the Cancer Center in honor of my mom. May you all continue to do the great things that you do and take comfort that although medicine couldn't save her, you still made a difference in her life and my family's as well. Sincerely, Denise. Denise, her mother, and her entire family are really why we do what we do each and every day. And Denise is also here with us today, and I want to thank her for sharing her experience with us. It was a brave and courageous thing. Thank you, Denise.
Also with us are members of Mrs. Lawrence's care team, Drs. Bob Fontana, Susan Erba, residents Peggy Williams, and Mariana DeMichelle and Nurse Leah Schultz. Could all of you please stand along with Denise? Well, one of the most important accomplishments we've achieved in the last five years is our effort to expand our footprint. Historically, we've been reluctant to get off the hill. Our comfort zone has been to stay in Ann Arbor and Southeast Michigan, with very few exceptions. But in the last five years, we've begun to expand our horizons. The strategic plan has guided this movement. Our goal? is to keep local care local, offer our services across the state as needed, and have patients referred back to us for high acuity care. In order to strengthen our statewide presence and reputation, we are developing physician partnerships and facility relationships more than ever before. Our relationships with others around the state is the single most important qualitative and quantitative change that our health system has made over the last five years. We've become a much more collaborative partner, and we've done so because we've recognized that we cannot survive now or into the future as an independent and isolated system. Our future depends on partnering and affiliating with others. And during the past five years, we've been transitioning to a model of partnership. We've enhanced our physician partnership network through participation and leadership in the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Physician Group Incentive Program and the Michigan Primary Care Transformation Demo, as well as the creation of the Physician Organization of Michigan Statewide Network and the POM ACO. We've grown our facility relationship network too, with our master affiliation agreement with Trinity Michigan Health, creation of the Pennant Statewide Hospital Network, our affiliation with Mid Michigan Health, and the Acute Care for Elders Unit at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, family medicine at Chelsea Hospital, and recently with the letter of intent we signed with Allegiance Health. I believe that in the future, what we will see is a combination of the traditional fee-for-service and population management models of care. And I believe that we will do as much care as possible locally in the community and only transfer whatever is absolutely necessary back to Ann Arbor. I also believe that the University of Michigan Health System will serve as a hub with spokes continuing to connect to other physician groups and facilities throughout the state. And although I will not be here when this happens, I believe that if we stay on this course, the University of Michigan Health System will significantly expand its footprint to become a true partner and an invaluable resource in Michigan and well beyond. I want to close by mentioning some other significant points of pride from the last five years. We made a major statement by elevating diversity, health equity, and inclusion as a top priority for the University of Michigan Health System. Our most visible progress on this goal is the creation of the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. We have also become an increasingly more global institution. A powerful example of this is illustrated on this slide. Between 2011 and 2014, more than 200 University of Michigan medical students participated in an international experience as part of their learning and training. Look how many of our medical students have had a global experience compared to medical students at other schools. And finally, we have built a powerhouse development team 
which envisioned, created, and continues to drive the health system's billion dollar Victors for Michigan campaign. The most ambitious campaign in our history. And we have already raised nearly $520 million toward that goal. This is just phenomenal. Let's give our development team and all of the rest of us a round of applause. Together, we have sustained and strengthened the University of Michigan Health System standing as one of the best academic medical centers in the country and in the world. And I am so confident that you will continue to prosper and lead. I know that the University of Michigan Health System will continue to evolve and will become even stronger in the future. I want to thank you for making the last five years truly remarkable. I encourage you to stay engaged in the important work ahead. You are in great hands with Dr. Michael Johns, and the search committee for your new EVPMA is truly an impressive group. But I do hope that during the search process that they will be honest with the candidates about what this job really entails. Because, you know, beyond the glitz and the glamour, there may be some other lesser known but very important duties that come along with this job. For example, you have to be committed to fitness. <laughs> and you have to really, this, there are some really important things about this job that they just didn't tell me when I started. You have to model weather safety procedures. <laughs> especially when there's a tornado warning. And you have to be willing to put on maize and blue chucks and dance for the kids. And you have to hone your acting and baking skills to keep up with the medical students who are Galen's. And most of all, you have to accept the fact that you are part of one of the most wonderful universities <laughs> and the best health system in the world and be thankful for it each and every day. To the leaders and best, I say, go blue. Thanks so much, Aura. You know, this is actually a time for you to sit back and actually enjoy, because it's our opportunity to say thank you. Good evening, and thanks for attending. My name is Bob Anderson. I'm the Chief Development Officer during this interim period, and really honored to be here to MC the rest of tonight's presentation. We're here to celebrate a dear colleague, somebody who you know, brought a personal passion that was just so inspiring to everybody who we worked with. So thank you for that. She's a leader who's had so much impact for so many of us with her strong vision and her approachable style and her compassionate style. Now, she did a really good job of sharing the, the um, kind of different aspects of the job that she wasn't told about before she came. Uh, and that kind of reminded me of a story about a kingdom half a world away where the king built a remarkable athletic complex. Uh, the centerpiece, Dave Brandon isn't here, right? It, it competes. The centerpiece was a gigantic pool, many times the length of a normal Olympic pool. And then there was this sandbar in the middle. And then there was another pool past that. Well, the king offered a challenge to everybody in his kingdom, but especially the strongest and the bravest, to swim across, to reach the sandbar, to cross the sandbar, to swim across the rest of the pool and make it to the other end. And the first person in his kingdom to do so would receive their choice of half the gold in the treasury, half the kingdom, or maybe, if they were particularly good, uh, the hand in marriage of the princess. When they arrived, they said, oh, this is not exactly what we expected. He had filled the pool with hungry piranha 
and electric eels on the first side. The sandbar was filled with poisonous snakes. And then there were ravenous sharks at the other end of the pool. Well, the king said, I'm looking for the best and the brightest and the bravest, and let's go. Who's going to be first? Well, at first there was quiet, but then there was a ruffle in the crowd, and a young man was seen diving in, swimming across the pool, leaping across the sandbar, and swimming again, even faster than the sharks, getting to the other side out of breath, but popping out of that pool pretty quickly. The king rushed over and said, said my gosh, that was fantastic. You've earned the prize. Do you want half the gold? And the guy hardly had breath left, and he said, no. And he said, oh, you're smart. You want half the kingdom. He said, no. And then the, the queen rushed over and said, he's smarter than you think. He wants the hand of the princess. And he said, no. And they said, well, what do, what do you want? And he said, I want to know the name of the person who pushed me in. When Aura arrived, she discovered that there was no strategic plan, but there were hundreds of visionaries working here. So she encouraged us, she incentivized us, all of us, all of us watching today, and even pushed us a little bit to build the future of healthcare. Now, there are still some asking, who pushed me? But the results of that story show the success of that idea. She gave us a vision for a new model where your inspiration, your hard work, combined with donor passion and results that give us gifts that enable the pages of medical history to be written here in extraordinary ways. But here in development, where we are, think of ourselves as front line in that effort, well, we weren't swimming alone or a jumped in. Aura was with us for more donor visits and more meaningful conversations than any before her. And she dearly loved the people that she met. And you know what? Those philanthropists dearly loved her. And they do to this day. I can tell you that she is going to spend the next two days with many of these philanthropists, making sure that they know that we are a solid place worth investing in in the future. She is directing them to the history of medicine that you're going to write. We won't, won't really know how many lives are changed by the, the philanthropy that you've made possible and the, the work that you're doing has made possible. We won't know for generations, but generations will be impacted by this amazing, amazing work. Aura has made a lasting mark here at the University of Michigan Health System during her five-year appointment. As Aura mentioned during the presentation, one of the most notable accomplishments that stand out, particularly to those of us in development, is the foundation she created to launch our $1 billion Victors for Michigan campaign. On behalf of the entire University of Michigan development team, we thank you for your support and your phenomenal and loving leadership. Well, enough for me. This evening, we're going to hear some remarkable speakers. Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs, Dean Jim's Willowscroft, Dean Jim's Jim. I'm sorry, Dean Willowscroft. I am just. <laughs> <laughs> and the Executive Director of the University of Michigan North Campus Research Complex, Dr. David Cantor. Our first guest speaker, Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs, received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Michigan College of Literature, Science, and Arts in 1991, and her medical degree from the University of Michigan Medical School in 1994. Additionally, she completed her internship and residency here at the University of Michigan Health Centers. A board-certified dermatologist, Regent Ryder Diggs is a physician in solo practice in cosmetic dermatology in Gross Point Farms, practicing general laser and cosmetic dermatology. 
Regent Ryder Diggs is personally and professionally involved in the community, and we all know that, but she joined the Board of Regents in 2012 and was the very first physician to serve on the Board of Regents. Please welcome to the stage Regent Shauna Ryder Diggs. Good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you, Bob, for the introduction. Uh, it's amazing to think that so many years have passed since I was here. Uh, I see some familiar faces, and it's a pleasure to be with you today on behalf of the Board of Regents and President Mary Sue Coleman. Uh, I'm just so delighted to be with you to celebrate your five years of achievement, Aura. Uh, achievement and progress at our health system that we can really uh, attribute to the visionary leadership of Dr. Ora Peskovitz. Uh, as you heard, it's particularly meaningful for me to be here this evening to participate in the celebration because of my Michigan roots. My passion for the Michigan medical community runs very, very deeply. And I, uh, I felt something when I was looking at the residents speaking on the video, seeing you here today, because I remember uh, very concretely my time here, both an undergraduate in medical school. I was in the Inaflex program as a Flexi at the time, as well as my internal medicine internship and my dermatology residency. Uh, University of Michigan is the place where I met my husband 25 years ago, where I had my first daughter, who'll be graduating from high school this year, uh, and where I met many of my long-lasting friends. This is where I hope to contribute to the legacy of the University of Michigan as a regent. And so, in doing so, as you heard, I'm the first physician to ever serve as a regent. I think it's very important for us in the medical community to realize that we can have an impact way outside of our daily practice in private solo dermatology. There, is not, there are opportunities for us to contribute to healthcare uh, as it changes in the next decades. When Aura first became the EVPMA five years ago, she brought to this position a rich legacy of leadership and many contributions. Uh, it's been my pleasure over the last two years to work closely with her, and I've learned her firsthand the depth of her commitment to our institution, the level of her commitment to patients and families, to discovery and innovation, to medical education, and to the faculty, staff, and students of the healthcare system. I felt a kinship with Ora immediately, in large part because we are both physicians. We have a physician-to-physician -physician connection. And as doctors, we understand the unique and the nuanced challenges that face healthcare in our industry today. When you consider healthcare reform, the NIH budget cuts, our technology expectations, meaningful use requirements, and the heightened attention by insurers to quality of care, there's no denying that we're in the midst of some truly defining moments in healthcare. And we experience these both at a large institution such as University of Michigan and also in my small practice in Gross Point Farms. Under Orr's leadership and guided by the strategic plan that she initiated the first year of her tenure, we've been able to demonstrate our ability to adeptly navigate these changes and the challenges that we, I believe, are very well positioned to handle whatever comes our way in the next years. Under Orr's direction, we have leveraged our opportunities to expand our statewide footprint. We're fulfilling the promise of our North Campus Research Complex, and we've established our institution as a leader in population management and quality and safety. With Aura at the helm of our health system, we've built the strong foundation that we need for the work that we must continue to do to remain viable, strong, and successful into the future. Finally, I want to say that Aura has been one of the most thoughtful and compassionate leaders with whom I've had the pleasure to work. Within days of my election to the Board of Regents, I opened my mail to find a very lovely note welcoming me to my role at the university. And I must say, this is quite important because I don't know how many of you realize, but uh, of the eight regents on our board, 
there are seven attorneys and one physician. <laughs> so I really appreciated the fact that someone reached out and welcomed me to the leadership of the university. As well, last year, a fire destroyed the University of Michigan student-run free clinic, and Orr was one of the first individuals to contact me to support the students' efforts to continue providing medical services in rural Pinckney. I also serve as the chair of the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Foundation Board, and we were able to assist with the rebuilding of the student-run free clinic. Uh, this was very important to me because when I was a medical student here, I participated and worked on the weekends in a similar program. Uh, and it was a grounding force in my life because during the time when you're studying in the classroom for two years, it was an opportunity to spend time with patients and remember why you're doing this work day to day. So it was an incredible experience. And I wanted to make sure that our students continue to have experiences such as this. The Student Run Free Clinic is a wonderful example of the will, the compassion, and the commitment to service in action that the University of Michigan demonstrates. It demonstrates the values and the character that I believe set U of M apart from other institutions. Above all else, Aura has been a leader guided by these same values. I recently came across a quote by Arthur Robert Byrne, and it immediately made me think of you. Uh, he said, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. Undeniably, Aura is driven by purpose, and you see it in her day-to-day -day actions, in her notes to our community, in her uh, relationships with the executive board, in her interactions with the regents. In the five years that she has been at the University of Michigan, she's demonstrated that there is no greater purpose than service to others and doing what you can do to make the world a better place. And we, thankfully, are all the better for it. For it. On behalf of my fellow regents, the University of Michigan community, I thank you, Aura, for enriching our lives, our community, and our place as leaders and best in medicine. Thank you. Well, I had the opportunity to work with Aura uh, virtually every week. And so I'm going to repeat a few things, but share some, some other thoughts. Leaders oftentimes are talked about in terms of what legacy do they leave for the institution that they serve in. So let me touch on just a few things. Frequently, it's talked about in monuments, things like buildings. And so think back regarding what are the key things that have happened during Ora's tenure here. We opened the Mott. We opened the von Voigtlander, truly, truly important edifices. Sometimes legacy is thought about in terms of finances. And just to really build on what Bob said, don't know how many of you realize the tremendous role that Aura has played with our donors. The Taubman Institute, a tremendous amount of negotiation there. Just yesterday, we celebrated the naming of the Frankel Cardiovascular Institute. And Aura has had a tremendous relationship ongoing with key donors. These are acts that will continue to give in perpetuity and will continue to make a tremendous difference. And there are many, many like that. These are but two examples. Sometimes, Leaders are remembered for personal accomplishments. And Aura was elected to the Institute of Medicine. She also received one of 25 Becker's Healthcare Leadership Awards in 2014. This award recognizes men and women who have made remarkable contributions and will leave lasting legacies to their respective health systems, hospitals, and communities. It really underscores the legacy and the role that Aura has had here at the University of Michigan Health System. Sometimes legacy is thought of in terms of new directions. Aura touched on that during her presentation today. She really did push us, not just with the strategic plan, but something that even I think Aura would say, we're still in the process of developing, 
and that is metrics. How do we hold ourselves accountable as a health system for the tripartite mission? And while this is an act in process, it's really been her driving force that has pushed us forward. It also is thinking differently. And again, as she mentioned, thinking not just in terms of Ann Arbor, but in terms of the state, of terms of the region and beyond. How do we partner with other health systems, with physicians, really to think about the provision of care in a very, very different way? Munson, the relationship with the Trinity Cancer Institutes, the ongoing development of the relationship with Trinity, the letter of intent with Allegiance, and perhaps the highlight of accomplishment is mid-Michigan to date. But that train continues down the tracks. It's a momentum that has been started, uh, and it has been really Aura's uh, initiative to push us in that direction. However, most importantly, in my opinion, legacy is determined not by buildings, not by finances, not by changes in direction, but by people. What effect does a leader have on people? It's been mentioned, or as compassion, or as thoughtfulness. Those of you that have had the privilege of being hosted by her know she's a consummate hostess. She also has done things that I think are incredibly brave, such as having a blog, uh, something I still haven't been able to figure out what it is. Uh, she sends myriad notes, is very thoughtful. Our medical students receive a book from her on white coat ceremony day. Uh, many of you probably don't even know what that is, but that's welcoming them to not just medical school, but the profession. And Aura has donated a book uh, that we present to each of those medical students. But I think all of these things, at least for me, really pale in comparison to the example that she has set for all of us of resilience and personal courage at a time of tremendous personal loss. Her example will leave an indelible and lasting impression on all of us here. And so I really think that Aura's legacy is in the people, the impact she's had here on each one of us. And so on behalf of the faculty, the students, the staff, I really want to thank you for all of you done for the University of Michigan. Thank you. So Aura, um, I truly appreciate this uh, opportunity to public, publicly express my thanks to you for the last four years that we have worked together. Um, I have just, uh, in these few words that follow, I hope I can convey uh, how truly pleased I am that our paths have crossed. In September 2009, uh, Aura asked me for some names of people who might be interested in the NCRC director position. Uh, over that weekend, uh, I prepared a list, and then on Monday, I tore it up. I gave her one name and tossed my hat into the ring. <laughs> I wanted that job. And I wanted that job in great part because Aura had paint, painted such a compelling picture of what she wanted the NCRC to become, as well as expressed her personal commitment to its success. The idea uh, that crystallized five years ago by Dean Willescroft and the department chairs is today more than halfway to completion. Uh, there are many people uh, faculty, leaders, staff, who deserve credit uh, for the NCRC, and Aura is one of those leaders. Uh, those who've read her articles uh, under the banner of Medicine That Speak um, will have caught a glimpse of both her passion and her compassion. Those who witnessed her, private resili her public resilience and her public, uh, I'm sorry, her public resilience and her private pain following the death of Mark, her husband, will understand Aura's true strength in adversity. 
Those who wanted the freedom to experiment and develop ideas of their own have appreciated uh, the free reign of Aura's leadership style. It's not for everyone, but it suited me very well. And I will be eternally grateful for the opportunities that Aura gave me uh, to serve this university these past four years. Uh, sometimes not everything goes as planned. Aura took the heat for me on several occasions and didn't take the path of expediency or capitulation. That's the sort of boss that everyone yearns for, but not everyone gets. I also saw the sides of Aura that she could not uh, nor would want to suppress. Uh, watching her serve lunch to honored guests when she herself was the most senior university leader present shows that nothing can hold back a Jewish mother from her inner self. <laughs> a adding a religious variant to this, Aura has a Protestant work ethic that few of us can match. <laughs> the security staff at NCRC was asked to keep an eye out for her when she turned up at five in the morning and was still there late into the evening. I observe Aura's deft touch with people, how she conveyed a sense of personal interest no matter the status of the individual. Aura has one voice, whether in private or in public, a sense of confidence in herself and a true belief in a common purpose. So Aura, thank you for what you have contributed here at Michigan. Thank you for your friendship. I will miss you. Thank you, Regent Diggs. Thank you, Dean Wilscroft, and of course, thank you, Dr. Cantor, for sharing wonderful memories, terrific thoughts, and wonderful words about Aura. Now, I understand that there is a, um, a one more person who wanted to speak tonight and is doing so by video. Hi, from New York, Aura. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person today, but glad to participate virtually. Your work at Michigan has been remarkable. Your accomplishments innumerable, and I'll leave it to others to enumerate those. I've been in development for 30 years, and I can tell you, you are a fundraiser's dream. Your vision, your commitment, your smarts, your passion, your boundless energy, fabulous, unmatched in my experience. From dance marathon, to travel, to Grand Rapids, to Palm Beach, you were a delight. And beef jerky on a road trip was a first, thank you very much. The health system had a remarkable campaign celebration a few weeks ago, and the organization is poised for remarkable success as a single integrated effort. This is an incredible legacy that you leave behind. Countless future patients and their families will have positive outcomes that they would not have had before if it were not for you. But more importantly, but most importantly, your courage and your moral center are what drew me in. Aura, I wish you the best of luck, but you won't need that in your next venture. On a personal note, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do the best work of my life. I will be forever grateful to you for bringing me to Ann Arbor. You are inspiring and know that this kid from New York will always be at your side. Have a great day. Our next guest gets the pleasure of working with Aura every day. Please welcome Quinta Verdi, Chief Administrative Officer and Chief of Staff for the Office of the EVPMA. All right, so Aura's quite surprised that I'm up here because I am a classic introvert and I would just as soon stand in the back of the room. So, um, but, so let me get started. The health system has had the good fortune to benefit from your leadership and vision over the past five years. I too have had that good fortune uh, to be part of your team. You have taught me something every day. 
um, if not several times a day, given your propensity to work 24-7. It has been a privilege. I'm honored to represent your team in the health system and to present you with this gift. Given your love for art, we want to express our sentiments in that medium. The artist, Sung Lee, who has displayed his work at the Ann Arbor Street Art Fair for years, creates woodcuts to tell his story. The gift, the gift is titled Good Fortune and represents not only the good fortune that you have brought to all of us, but also serves to wish you continued success in your future endeavors. As you look at the images represented in the piece, you will see groupings of two. He uses each grouping to exemplify areas in one's life reflecting wishes for good fortune. For example, you'll see a happy home is represented by a tree in a house. Four apples on a tree is good fortune for each of the four seasons. Two fish together signifies good luck day and night. And the sun and the moon symbolize happiness day and night. We hope that you will look upon this piece and smile often, that the colors will brighten your day, and that you will enjoy telling your future team and guests the story of our mutual good fortune. Well, you know, I have to have the last word. Uh, <laughs> so, Bob, thank you so much for those beautiful words. And certainly wasn't expecting Brian on the uh, video, but that was really wonderful. I hope you will thank him as well. And uh, Regent Diggs, thank you so very much. And uh, Dean Wallacecroft, thank you for those uh, very meaningful sentiments. And Dr. Cantor as well. Uh, that was really uh, very wonderful. You know, um, Henry Ford said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, but staying together is success. And I feel that all of us as a health system uh, really are uh, the perfect example of success. Um, I want to thank the regents as represented by uh, Regent Diggs. President Coleman and my fellow executive officers for making my time here really so wonderful. The leadership of our health system, our chairs, our faculty, our students, and um, really everyone who really makes our health system what it is for making my time here so remarkable. We have an incredible cabinet and unfortunately some of our leaders had to be out of town when we scheduled this meeting, but I want to especially acknowledge our cabinet, uh, led by Doug, Paul, Tony, Jim, Dave, Denise, Quinta, Kara, and before Kara, Gina. Uh, because our cabinet, which is really the leadership of the health system, really is what makes our health system run. It's the group that meets weekly. And we run by a set of rules, and I just wanted to tell you about these rules that we call the rules of engagement. Um, and we created these rules um, to allow us um, to actually function, and I thought you should hear about them. Um, they're rules that we called TRAC, um, and they stand for T for trust, R for results, A for accountability, the first C stands for constructive conflict, and the second C stands for commitment. And most of the time, but not always, we follow those rules in our cabinet. And I just thought that you should know that that cabinet, which leads the rest of the health system, uh, is made up of an incredibly committed group of people. And um, I believe that the rest of the health system should follow those rules of trust, a commitment to results, a commitment to accountability, that's the metrics that Dean Willis-Croft was referring to, a commitment to have conflict, but constructive conflict, because I believe that constructive conflict does keep an institution on its toes, and a commitment to commitment. And I believe that if you're committed to those things, you'll end up with really great results. And I just think that it is so hard to get in any institution that is better than this one. 
and with the leadership team like the one that we have, you'll be in great hands in the future. I want to especially acknowledge a group of people that I believe are unsung heroes and that really never get acknowledged. And I would like these six people who really won't want to do this, but to please stand now. Uh, and I'd like each of them to do this, please. Um, so um, thank you for turning on the lights. Um, for the rest of my comments, you can keep the lights on because there's no slides. Um, Shauna Goebel, please stand and you can hold your applause till they all six stand. Tenley Sturkel, Natasha Arnold, Allison Krieger, Joette Gowdy, and Quinta Vridi. You can sit down now. <laughs> uh, they didn't like that. This is the staff of the EVPMA office. And um, I will just make a special comment about um, Allison, who actually uh, was responsible for today's presentation. An enormous amount of work goes into presentation like the one that was done today. But the office of the EVPMA, um, it's a very difficult place. Quint alluded to the fact that, uh, or David alluded to the fact that I arrive at 5 and leave at 10. Um, not all of them are there all of those hours, but um, they do work really hard um, because I've been a slave driver and, um, and they don't um, ever complain about um, the amount of work that I have given them um, over these last five years. Some of them actually didn't make it all five years. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I suspect that my successor is also a slave driver, and so um, they've been trained well to work hard, and they are really amazing. And I want to thank you, um, the six of you personally, um, for just being extraordinary, and the rest of the health system thanks you um, for the amazing work that you do, and um, we are really indebted to you. I want to take a moment um, to say something about um, what I have often talked about, um, and that is work-life balance. And David, you've talked about this too. Um, there is no such thing as work-life balance because we actually only have one life. And so um, when you want to try to find balance, you have to really um, find that in your life. And that is to try to find a way to live the best life that you can in both your home and your work and figure out a way to make that balance. And I have to say that I believe that I am the luckiest person alive because I've had the best personal life and the best work life. And I am very grateful for every part of my work life and every part of my personal life. I was fortunate to have grown up with the most wonderful family, I have the most amazing parents, and I have the three most incredible brothers, each of whom are smarter than I am, more capable than I am, and more accomplished than I am. So it's a pretty competitive house, I have to say. Um, I'm the oldest, um, but each of them is um, really extraordinary. And as you have heard from uh, most of the speakers, um, I was married for 31 years to the most fascinating, interesting, and accomplished man. And I was really lucky to have had that wonderful marriage and that wonderful life and to have lived with such a remarkable man who gave me um, the most wonderful experiences and three remarkable children. And that life and Mark's death actually also offered me a wonderful opportunity because in that life and even in his death, it opened a world for me and it gave me the opportunity to realize what is important in life. And when you have such a wonderful life and even when something tragic like Mark's death and some, most of you I think know that my husband died about a year and a half after I came here, that death actually caused me to realize that Life can happen in a moment, and death can happen in a moment. And it causes you to have to appreciate everything that you experience. It also caused me to realize that I have something in common 
with every patient that we have in our health system. And it caused me to understand why it is necessary for us to provide the ideal patient care experience for every one of our patients. And it caused me to understand that I need to live every moment of my life in a way in which purpose is important. And that I need to think about that every moment of every day. And so I am thinking about that in my future and I hope that you will think about that in your future. I've been fortunate to have found love again, and I'm delighted to have met Dan, and I'm delighted, Dan, that you're here with me today. Thank you for being here. It's important to find joy and happiness in the world. But as Leo Rostin said, I cannot believe that the purpose of life is merely to be happy. I think the purpose of life is to be useful, to be responsible, to be compassionate. It is, above all, to matter, to count, to stand for something, to have made some difference that you have lived at all. Make a difference. And now, let's go eat.